I'll, I'll recrown this end and uh, and we'll let people in, okay? Good. Let's go. And, uh, bueno. and then I'm letting people in. <clears throat> Buenas tardes a todos, ¿cómo están? Vamos a dar inicio a un nuevo evento de Fundación Libertad, mientras se van sumando, todavía nos queda alguna gente en la sala de espera y otros más que van entrando. Hoy tenemos un verdadero placer, un privilegio, un honor. Estoy haciendo esta primera parte en español, eh, ella yo sé que entiende porque con su español cada vez eh, que charlamos eh, me sorprende eh, Luego vamos a hacerlo en inglés, eh, es decir, eh, vamos a continuar la conversación en inglés eh, con ella Porque hoy tenemos a la profesora Dirdra McCloskey, directo desde los Estados Unidos eh, de América Ahí está saludando desde Chicago con el gran cañón eh, de fondo eh, Yo voy a hacer eh, la presentación Ahora en inglés, el año pasado cuando la tuvimos aquí también vía online, la habíamos hecho en español, esta vez la vamos a hacer en inglés. Ya la tuvimos además en el 2019, mayo de 2019, con nosotros en Argentina, en Buenos Aires, recorriendo esa semana la ciudad en sendos eventos, y para nosotros fue un verdadero gusto. Y ahora voy a pasar al inglés para el resto de la charla. Sí, los invitamos a que vayan utilizando el chat, la ventanita de chat que tienen al costado, para poder luego compartir con nosotros, dejar preguntas, para poder hablar con Dirdra. So now I'm going to English, we're going to have the rest of the conversation in English, but I know that Dirdra understood what I was saying as I Oh, of course. She, as, <laughs> as I said, she speaks uh, Spanish and she always uh, <laughs> learns new words and she always surprises me. No, uh, I don't. Exchange. Oh, you do, Dira, you do. No, I don't. Uh, Here, I, I, have a, I have a Spanish joke. A person who knows three languages is called trilingual. A person who knows two is called bilingual. A person who knows one is called una gringa. <laughs> I, I, I always like that one because that, that, that's a bilingual joke as well, so it, it, it has two languages. Uh, as I was saying, I was, I was going to do now the, the formal introduction and now in English, uh, as Zizra always has uh, on her website. Didra N. McCloskey has been since 2000 UIC Distinguished Professor of Economics, History, English and Communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Trained at Harvard as an economist, she has written 20 books and edited seven more and has published some 400 articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, as she always says, rhetoric, that's the way to pronounce it in English, uh, feminism, ethics and law. She taught for 12 years in economics at the University of Chicago and describes herself now and she's always updating uh, her description. That's what I always like. Uh, her latest description is uh, uh, on her official website uh, as a postmodern free market quantitative Episcopalian feminist Aristotelian. The Aristotelian part is new one, but she also has the classic version. She describes herself as a literary quantitative postmodern free market, progressive <laughs> Episcopalian, ex-Marxoid, Midwestern woman from Boston who was once a man, not conservative. <laughs> I'm a Christian classical liberal. That's what she always says in, in the classic version of this presentation. Uh, she has written so many books. Uh, you know her, of course, because of the Bourgeois Virtues, uh, that trilogy uh, that is really inked in our hearts. Uh, her latest book, at least one of her latest books is Why Liberalism Works, How True Liberal Values Produce a Freer, More Equal, Prosperous World for All. Uh, that's how we title this presentation and that's why, Deidre, uh, we are pleased uh, of having you and that's why we want to start with that very question. Why does liberalism work? Well, it's, it's great being... In Argentina, even though I'm in, in, in Chicago, it, it works as you can see in the very medium we're in. Because under liberalism, under even an approximation of it, which you have in Argentina, 
I have in my country, even though even though it's not perfect, it's much better than it once was, the permission to try things out. So the people who invented Zoom, they thought, well, and this was before the uh, before the COVID, they thought, well, let's have a, a, a meeting um, technology. Uh, and there, there are lots of other people trying to do the same thing. And this, here, here's, here's the analogy that I like people to get in their heads. We wouldn't want to centrally plan art, music, science, um, uh, love affairs, um, friendship. We wouldn't want there to be a ministry of friendship <laughs> that would tell us who to make friends with. And in the same way, if we have the, the core of, of, uh, of liberalism, therefore, is an equality of permission. That's the crucial word. Not an equality of opportunity, as people often say, but letting you open a business when you want or move to another part of the country to work, buy from whom you wish. This is, I know, a very big issue in Argentina, which has a long history of preventing people from buying from foreigners in aid in order to protect one group of Argentinians and hurt everyone else. So it, it works and, and it, it's new comparatively. I'm a historian as well as an economist. And so I think that, <laughs> that uh, the 1700s were just yesterday in my mind. Um, and that's when this idea came. And it, it, it was amazing. It's, here, here's, how, here's how well it worked. Argentina, the United States, France, Italy, China, Finland, Japan, name the country. <clears throat> the average person is 20 to 40 times, you hear that? 20 to 40 times better off than they were in 1800. <laughs> that's, two, that's not doubling or tripling, that's 2,000% or 4,000% increase. So this equality of permission works. Deidre, uh, I want to follow up with a question that ties uh, with what's been going on and that ties back to our latest conversation with you that we had last year that we had to have through Zoom because the pandemic was uh, already starting. Uh, it was yeah. barely starting actually because it, it was back in, in April, back in May 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, since you can analyze things not only from a personal viewpoint, but also from a professional viewpoint because of your expertise. What have you learned during the past year from humanity, from the way that we have reacted to the pandemic? Well, I've learned that, but I already knew this. I, I learned that, 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 that people are rather, what would we say, simple-minded about economics and don't quite understand it. Um, that I've, I've, I've learned that it's, e it's rather easy for the government to panic people. Uh, the great American journalist of a century ago, Henry L. Mencken, would say, said once that uh, the job of a politician is to terrify people and then offer the solution. Uh, Argentinian Manufacturing is in terrible shape because we let Brazilians or Americans or, or Chinese people uh, send goods to Argentina. We must cut our, oh my God, my God, let's save ourselves. Let's stop trade with Brazil. And, and that's how the government has reacted to COVID. Now, on the other hand, um, I think that uh, in a plague, thank God it's not worse. Thank God it's not Ebola or the Black Death or something like that, where, where the mortality is much, much higher. 
But in a plague, there is a role for the state. Uh, but the state keeps not doing it very well. I don't know. I've, I've, I, I, I try to learn from, from um, experience, but I'm a slow thinker. So it always takes me a year or two <laughs> to realize what I learned, to recognize it. Oh, yeah. That's why my forehead is sloped, <laughs> because I keep saying, oh, oh, my God, oh. <laughs> so the next question, Vidra, and I really liked uh, this uh, idea that you pose about people in general being simple-minded about economics and politicians yeah, frightening yeah. us uh, to, to, into offering them a solution to, to the problems yeah. that maybe they themselves fabricated. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to do what uh, corresponds when I say this name, Adam Smith, right? I, 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 I did. Sure. I always cross myself. So uh -huh. we both did. Uh, do you think Adam Smith, woman of the system, has gotten worse this year? Well, it depends. I mean, I the other day they were saying about Germany, which at first looked very competent in the German way, the usual German way, in handling the uh, epidemic. Now, confidence in the, in the competence of the government is falling in Germany, of all places. Now there's a third wave. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, it's a mixed bag. I hope, I hope people realize that, um, that government, you know, I, I'm not an anarchist. I have friends who are anarchists, and I, I and I love them, but I'm 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 a liberal. I'm a John Stuart Mill type liberal, Milton Friedman type liberal, and so I believe, as I said before, that there's a role for government. The problem is, it's like <laughs> the old Arabic uh, proverb: if you let the nose of the camel into the tent, pretty soon. The camel is all the way in the tent, and that's the danger. And it's and it's it's a it's a vivid, important danger in Argentinian economic history. I don't need to, I don't need to tell you. It really is, uh, Deidre, uh, and I can't stop thinking now about the camel that you mentioned because yeah. uh, I, I think that if, uh, one issue that it has been worrisome, at least in, in South America, but also in many parts of the world, uh, has been uh, about education, about how some measures, for example, closing schools and not letting yeah, yeah. Uh, kids uh, uh, attend them uh, yeah. in Argentina in 2020. They had no uh, classes in person throughout the whole school year, which yeah. uh, poses uh, many, many questions on, on the damage that may have been caused yeah, that's to, right. to these kids. Uh, do, do you feel that uh, the, the values uh, that you uh, work so much uh, on you know, your bourgeois dignity trilogy are at risk nowadays, Deidre? They're always at risk, um, which is a shame. But I, I write these books, and you work in your um, institute to change people's minds. We can't, we haven't got the army behind us. Thank God, I'm glad. One of the problems with Chilean liberalism is that liberalism came from the army. It came from coercion. And that's been a deep worry um, in, in Chile ever since. So all we have is, the, is, the, is our, our abilities, whatever they are, to persuade. Sweet talk, as I call it, sweet talk. And um, once, liberalism was the ideology that people held in their heart. In 19th century Argentina, in the Argentina of the 1800s, liberalism was how people were taught. If they went to France to university or something, that's what they learned. 
But then in the last century, it's changed. And now when, when people go to university, they learn Marxism, as I did. Um, I was once a, a socialist myself. And it's very hard to get out of that mentality. That's, that's one point on the kind of sort of among the, the what I call the clerisy, the, the intellectuals, the, the journalists and so forth. That's the problem is this educational problem. But then uh, in, in, on the side of just ordinary people, um, the, the problem is that they've come to expect the government to take care of themselves, of them. I, I, I think of it, and here, here's the problem. Here's why we always need to argue against it and try to, try to get people back to thinking of themselves as adults. Another word for liberalism would be adultism. Because all the other philosophies, in one way or another, treat ordinary people like children. If, they're, if, the, if the philosophy is conservative, and, uh, then, then it's the, the children are bad children and need to, be, need to be crushed and you need to bring out the police and the army. If it's on the left, they're, they're sad, pathetic, silly children and they need to be regulated and corrected and, and taken care of. So particularly, I, I think this, this, this kind of talk might appeal to young people. Young people want to be adults. Well, here's your chance, kids. <laughs> uh, be a liberal. Always uh, listening to you, Deirdre, and speaking with you, uh, 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 there appear so many different ideas and, and paths that, that we can take uh, for this discussion. So I, I'd like to follow. Um, we'll leave the role of, of government for, for later because I think that there's a, a really big discussion to, to, to have there, a really interesting one. Uh, but I'd like to, to follow the path uh, that has to do with your own personal experience, which you have uh, explain uh, from time to time and you should you just said so when it comes to marxism that is taught in universities that happens yeah. as well in, in argentina you get marxism you get Keyn sure. keynesianism you, uh, and those are the mainstream ideas in argentina and have been so for at least uh, the past 50 to 60 years i mean yeah. uh, unchanged uh, and i guess that part of what we do is try to uh, push forward and present the ideas of liberty, and that's a, a way of helping people find it. Yeah. But how did you uh, find the ideas of liberty uh, and leave the ideas of Marxism behind in, in your own personal and professional experience? Well, it was very slow. It was not a road to Damascus like, like St. Paul. Uh, suddenly I saw the truth. Um, I was a uh, an anarchist to begin with, except a socialist anarchist. This was when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I followed Prince Kropotkin in, uh, in Russia, who was a, a wonderful man in, in, in many ways, a 19th century anarchist. And then I, and I see, look, I'm very old. I was born in 1942, so you are you, you are not old, Didra. Uh, old is the wind. Old is the wind, and it keeps blowing. That's right. Don't 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 do the arithmetic. It's very su surprising. Uh, uh, so I, then I was uh, a, a socialist in the way that everyone was. I was not ever a communist. Um, if I was any kind of communist, I was a Trotskyist, a kind of loose Trotskyist. Uh, but then, I, I, you know, it, what was on offer at Harvard College, where I went, was, uh, was Keynesian thinking, which is kind of social engineering, uh, socialism light. But it's actually turned out to be rather heavy. It's the idea that everyone's a child and we need to help you. And the old joke is, one of the one of the most unbelievable sentences in English is, "I'm from the government and I'm here to help you." 
Um, you, you actually tell that one uh, as the three lies joke. I, I, yeah. I've seen you on a stage saying that one, which is great. I, I don't know if you want to remind the audience. Sure, the sure. It's, it's an old joke. I, 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 one of the male habits I've kept, and I, I apologize for it, um, is that I, I do like telling jokes. Um, I have a, a little group of them that I tell all the time, and one of them is classic. The three most unbelievable sentences in English, and they would be very easy to translate into Spanish. The first is, the check is in the mail. You know, mañana, pasado mañana. Uh, the second one is, of course I'll respect you in the morning. Think about it. The third one is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. And I, I in, in the 1960s, uh, my, my, I was against the war in Vietnam and so forth, um, but I was a social engineer. We graduates of Harvard and Princeton and Yale were going to go down to Washington and, and help you. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, we were gonna help you. And then I, my, my first job was at the University of Chicago and I was tenured there and, and um, I was there for 12 years. And, and I had already, even before I went to Chicago, started to think of economics as something you could really apply. And there were a number of other influence, there were an, uh, a number of people who influenced me. So I gradually, gradually, gradually um, turned. Um, you know, I'm fond of saying I've been everything in my life except a European-style conservative. I have never been that, but everything else. And, and it's an advantage, actually. I have lots of friends who have always been liberals. They read, I don't know, um, Ayn Rand or something. And then when they were 18, you can, you can only like Ayn Rand if you read her when you're 18. If you try to read her when you're 38, it doesn't work out well because I don't like her novels. But anyway, um, <laughs> but the, the, they've always been like that. And, but whereas I've, I, have, I still have lots of friends who are, who are socialists and it helps because then you're, you're at least, at least you know they're not evil people or even stupid. It's just, uh -huh. You know, it's kind of strange about economics because some of the things that economics says are very simple once you understand them. But I think that's true of lots of things. I'm going to say the next thing in, in Spanish because it's for the audience. Sí. Siéntanse libres eh, de, de sumar en el chat si quieren hacer preguntas, las pueden hacer en español, así que no sí, tengan sí. Eh, miedo. I, I was just invite in people of course. To, to write in, in, in the chat box if, if they feel like it, don't, that, that they shouldn't hesitate on, on doing so. No, no. Uh, I'm, going I'm to the do answer it. lady. I can answer any <laughs> question about your, about your love life. You want advice? I'm here to answer your questions. <laughs> I, I, I always liked those uh, old robots uh, that they had at fairs where you had to put a coin <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I, 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 and you could ask a question. We never had those, but I, I always watched, saw them in movies. So that's why. Yeah, yeah, well, why but you know, up. the same thing is uh, Chinese, uh, uh, um, Chinese cookies. What are yeah. they called? Where you get, uh, you get the, that, by the way, was invented in the United States. The fortune cookies. Fortune where, cookies. Where yeah, they, they're not Chinese. They were invented in the United States. <laughs> but 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 if you have to have Chinese food at an American restaurant, then you are going to get them. Of course, yeah. that's the, yeah. the default yeah. American experience. Yeah. Uh, you just told us, uh, Deidre, uh, that uh, bourgeois dignity values are always at risk. Do you yeah. perceive, uh, uh, as an economist and as a historian, um, a change in values uh, coming in, something that is different from what it used to be before in the economic uh, sense, in the political sense? I don't, I don't, I think it's easy to exaggerate how much it's changed recently. But I think there was a big change about a century ago. And, and there ought to be more academic work on this because I think it happened in Argentina and the United States at about the same time in the 1920s and 30s, uh, there was this big shift to the child view 
of the citizen. Now understand, I, I, I talk of myself as a Christian liberal. So I acknowledge an obligation that you and I have towards the poor, for example. But the main obligation we have is to give the poor permission to start a business, to own the land under their favela, to uh, enter any occupation they want, to buy anywhere they want. And if you do that, the working class, the poor people get, get rich, get, get and, and that's the main way you should help the poor. But I'm, I'm not against um, uh, helping people in a, you know, in a disaster, if there's a flood or something, or if they're very poor or they're being uh, uh, abused by their husband or something, I, I think there's a role for the state for, for coercion. Um, but, but, but the problem is the, 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 the nose of the camel. Uh, what, what we, we, there is this kind of slip that, as they say in philosophy, there is a slippery slope. And it's, we started slipping about 100 years ago. And that's been the big ideological change in the West. Look, uh, once the camel was, was <laughs> so to speak, already in the tent, that was back in the, in the 1700s, it, it accepted was another camel. <laughs> this, this analogy is getting kind of crazy, but the camel then was hierarchy, was if you're a wife, your husband is, the, the, is your master. If you're black, your master is your master. If you're a subject of the king, the king is the master. Everyone had a master. And that was broken down in, in, in liberalism. Another way to describe liberalism is it's the ideal of a masterless society. Uh, in the last three centuries, the intelligentsia of Europe, the clerisy, has had three ideas. The first one was li li liberalism breaking down masters. The second one was nationalism, where the master is the nation. And the third is socialism, where the master of the economy is the state. And the second two are terrible ideas. If you think you like nationalism and socialism, maybe you'll like national socialism, which as you know, is the official name of Hitler's political party. Masterlessness is what we should be looking for. That doesn't mean you don't help people. It just means you don't boss them around. That's quite clear, Deidre. Uh, we have something getting questions from the audience. We have one Good. from Gisho Nacle. Uh, he says, Professor, do you think we should change how we measure GDP, taking into account green capital? How could we make capitalism ecologically sustainable, he asks. Well, I, I, I worry about global warming, as I think any sensible person should. Um, but, you know, we've solved a lot of environmental problems in a and I, 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 by the way, I don't much like the word capitalism. I can explain that if you want, but, but in, a, in a market way. Uh, for example, um, Margaret Thatcher uh, was one of the leaders uh, against hairspray. And by the way, uh, um, 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 air conditioning fluid that was causing a whole in the ozone layer at the North and South Poles. Margaret Thatcher, the so-called conservative, um, and, a, and a big user of hairspray, by the way. <laughs> she always has these big hair, hair, hairdos. Um, As we saw on in The Crown season four. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, that, that was a very unsympathetic portrait of, of, uh, of Margaret. But, but she, she worked with other governments, again, a role for government, and we, and we solved this problem. The hole in the ozone layer declines every year, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. 
We, a hundred years ago, there was a really terrible problem of not, even not a hundred years ago, a f- half a century ago, there was a terrible problem of air pollution, urban air pollution in Los Angeles and, and everywhere else. And that was solved with, um, with, with taxation of, uh, of, of, uh, of gasoline and so, so forth. So there are market ways of doing it. And that's what I re- recommend. We have a, one from Roberto Brenes. Uh, he says, Professor, I found your critique of Piketty's capital incisive. Uh, would you like to add something uh, on that, Deirdre? Yeah, and in fact, in this bu- book that you mentioned, which uh, is- and, been- and I think I, I think we have Roberto who would like to add something. Uh, I just unmuted him if he wants to add a sure. little. Sure. Professor, the, 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 the question went, went just half of the question. When you critique Piketty, which yeah. I think you're being, you know, really gentle to Piketty, you brought, <laughs> you brought an issue which I find very interesting is that you point out almost as a matter of fact that Marxist deal with the problem of supply response as it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's right. And when we when we look at what Marxists and all these state governments in Amer- in Latin America, for example, do is always putting bureaucracy and all yeah. sorts of uh, problems that in fact what they do is to hamper and cripple supply response. That's right. And uh, I think we have not looked into this issue of uh, re- supply response as we should. Well, I, I think that's that's absolutely true. And I, I, I keep seeing exactly what you're saying, the absence of, uh, of uh, supply response in the attitudes of of professional economists people who claim to know economics and yet they they think that that um well for for example he thinks piketty thinks that um the only way to solve uh the the a shortage of oil is to for the government to i guess to take over the oil wells or something because no more oil will be produced if the price goes up. Now, this is local. I think we have to agree. This is insane. And it's been shown over and over and over again in the, in the, in the history of the oil industry in the last, well, 100 years. The higher the price of oil, the more oil is provided. Deidre, we have a question from Federico Hernandez. Uh, he says, let me imagine why you don't want the word capitalism. Is, is it because that word is a reduction of human freedom to the economic angle? That's uh, what he asked. That... No, although I, I agree with him that we must not reduce our lives to economics exclusively or to the economic angle. No, the, the, the main reason is that it's scientifically misleading. The word is a scientific error compressed into a single word. And the error is this. The error is that we got rich from investment. We got rich from accumulating capital. And that is false. Now, unfortunately, even Adam Smith, I crossed myself again, he believed this. And economists have thought this ever since Adam Smith. Marx was a student of Adam Smith and a a fairly intelligent one, and he believed it. And people think that because it's called capitalism, accumulation must be the heart of it. But the fact is that what if, if you look around you, you can see immediately that although you sometimes need the investment, sometimes the accumulation is necessary, not always, but sometimes, the what's unusual about the modern world is innovation. It's the new ideas that make investment valuable that are that are important. Look, take containerization. This this character in uh, in North Carolina in 1956, um, uh, name uh, Mackay was that his name? No, 
Malcolm McLean said, hmm, let's put, <laughs> let's make standardized boxes with corrugated sides, you know, so they're strong, can be piled on top of each other and fill them with goods and send them to China. And then they can send them back. That's just an idea. Now, of course, you needed the capital to make it happen, but you also needed a labor force and the rule of law and the absence of a world war and <laughs> all kind of the sunlight and the existence of humans and all kinds of they're all they're an infinite number of necessary conditions. But what was sufficient to make it happen was the idea, was the creativity of an individual having permission to try it out. So I want to call it innovism. I want us to stop using the word, very misleading word, capitalism, and and call what we live in right now innovism. And that'll turn our mind in Argentina and everywhere else to the conditions of innovation and thinking, oh, I see. Well, you've got to have free speech if you're going to have innovation. So I guess I better be in favor of that too. You, we, we better have gender freedom, such as uh, uh, we didn't have, and certainly in the United States, although this is much less so I've learned in Latin America than in the United States. Um, in or, you know, you, liberty is liberty is, is, is liberty. And it's completely clear that slaves don't innovate. Children don't innovate. Small children don't. All linguistic change is caused by teenagers precisely because they found their, their freedom in making up new ways of speaking Spanish or English. So you, that's my, sorry, I could go on for an hour, but I won't. <laughs> but we are happy with uh, everything you're saying, Deidre. Uh, the audience is, is uh, so as well. Federico uh, just put very good answer. Thank you. We got a thank you there. from Gisha and Aclea as well. Um, Actually, uh, I, I'm going to to take a forking path uh, as well because you just mentioned something that I think is uh, quite topical and quite important nowadays, which has to do with gender issues. Why yeah. do you think, Didra, that uh, this important issue uh, has been uh, mostly primarily taken, if we can still use that, that distinction by the left instead of the whole political spectrum, at least in South America? I'm not sure, quite sure what you mean. You mean the idea of gender itself? Uh, the, the, the discussion on, on gender and why it's such an important thing to have on, on the yeah, table. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it is important. And, and I, there I agree with my, 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 my colleagues on the left. The problem is that there are some of them, so-called TERFs, T-E-R-F, trans-exclusionary radical feminists. For some reason, this group, these TERFs, are very, very influential in Britain, of all places. It's quite surprising. Not so much in the United States, but and, and certainly not in Argentina, I don't think. But, including a famous uh, British author. Yeah, well, a, a, a number of them. Yeah, that's right. In fact, I signed a open letter that appeared in Harper's Magazine that Harper's um, ask people to sign. And both uh, 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 she and I signed the letter. It was a very moderate appeal for free speech. Because although I don't agree with R R R Rowling's views about transgender people, including me, I think she should be allowed to speak. I think her childish books are kind of childish, but that's OK. That's her right. To, to, so so I, I, it, it's, it's, it's not that I want these people to be um, uh, dismissed from their job or anything like that, but I do believe that gender liberty of various kinds is very important, especially, of course, um, 
uh, 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 feminism, the liberty of women, whether born women or trans women, to uh, to be adults, to be treated as adults, and to be free to choose, as Milton Friedman and, and Rose said. Um, in fact, Milton and Rose, I went to Milton's, what was it, his 90th birthday. And uh, I, I was Deirdre by then, I had changed. And they were very courteous, exactly as you would expect real advocates, real practitioners of, of liberty to be. Deidre, we spoke about this last year. Uh, we spoke a little bit before starting this conversation today, and it comes down to politics uh, and values and how things are going. Uh, uh, now we know the results of the 2020 election. Uh, oh. Thank God. <laughs> how, how would you explain? Uh, I, I know that you said it, that it, it will probably take you a whole year to actually decide on, on how to, to explain what just happened. But yeah, yeah. How, how do you explain the Trump phenomenon? Uh, well, look, look, look. It, it's every country. And again, I don't need to tell Argentinians this. They, they've experienced it on their pulse. Has fascists. There are, there are fascist impulses in France, and certainly in China. And, I mean, anywhere you look, there are going to be groups that are nationalist and socialist at the same time, national socialists. And I, know, I don't throw around the word freely, but I think in a precise sense, Trump has shown himself over and over again, and especially in this horrible business in uh, January 6, as a, as a, as a fascist, as a, and, and his followers are fascists. But so the, Biden is a statist, but a statist is not a fascist, although fascism involves statism. The, the statism being the idea that all problems are to be taken care of by the government um, and not by uh, individual um, um, permission. Uh, but but he's not a, he's not a uh, he, you know it's a great improvement. Express it that way. I mean, it's like moving from the from the generals in Argentina to uh, a, a democracy. Now, I think everyone in Argentina will agree, whether left, right, or, 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 or liberal, that Argentinian politics is really crazy, loco. I mean, this is nuts, but it's still democratic. I, I mean, it is, I like the local thing, the local thing, because uh, as you know, we have a president that uh, was chosen by the vice president to be the candidate, which I think it's something that uh, I, I know we, we Argentines like to think that we are exceptionals and that we are all so different from the rest of the world in ways that we really are not, because there are many patterns that are, are, are always seen across the world. But I think that we do have the first president that was chosen by a vice president, at least <laughs> in modern times, uh, which is not something to be proud of. But as you said, we know about local stuff. Um, following on, on, on another issue that uh, I, I've gotten on, on personal messages of people that are uh, watching uh, our conversation, uh, and it has to do with statistics because many people have been worried about uh, how to interpret them, how they are collected, the data yeah. uh, when it comes to COVID. What do you think about COVID statistics? What do you think that they can tell us about what's been going on? Well, it, it, there, there are high level theoretical problems that I'm not going to get into because I'm not an I'm not an epidemiologist, um, but it, 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 it's quite clear in my, I'll speak of my own country. We really um, did a bad job early on on testing. 
And I don't see how you can fight a, um, a plague if you don't know who's sick. And the problem with this particular bug, this, this virus, is that it's quite unusual in people getting sick without knowing it. I mean, people say, oh, it's like the flu. No, it's not. If you've got the flu, you know you've got the flu. If you got Ebola, you really know you've got Ebola. Not, not this one, which makes it very important if, 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 if this role of the state is going to be done intelligently, you got to test. But we didn't, and I think it's true in Argentina. It's certainly true in Brazil that they didn't test, and that now it's completely chaotic. So, you know, look, as I told you, in my youth, I thought of myself as an economic engineer, right? I was going to choose your life for you. Well, we're going to run the Ministry of Friendship. I'm telling you, I was going to be friends. My, with that, that's right. You, 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 you've got to work with her, not with him, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, but that's, uh, if you're going to do that, at least you have, should have the engineer's attitude. I admire engineers very much. Um, and I've, I've uh, followed uh, engineering intellectual attitudes all my life in a lot of ways. I always ask how big, how much? That's a characteristically engineering question. And of course you need to have the information if you're going to be a social engineer. And I think it's very foolish to be rushing off in one direction or another without knowing what the pattern of infection is. Uh, we also discussed um, a thing before we started that I think it's worth sharing with, with the audience, Deidre. Uh, it has to do with uh, uh, something that has been taking place for the last 4,000 years, and in Argentina it has been taking place since ever, which has to do with the control of prices. We were talking about the USSR, we were talking about how the vaccines are distributed. Uh, Argentina actually has in place uh, a control prices program uh, where they, uh, they, they, they are um, persecuting um, companies because uh, they might be um, asking for an extra peso uh, on the yeah, bag yeah. of cookies uh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. What, what can you tell us about control prices in 2021, the 21st century? Yeah, it's, 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 it's never worked. It always doesn't work. As soon as you prohibit something, you create a black market, uh, a pressure to allocate it um, in some other fashion, with violence, or with uh, um, uh, influence, or with under the table payments of money, or with politics, and it's in in the United States, we we had, had a little teeny experiment with um, with socialism. We have quite a few of them actually, but this one experiment with COVID vaccine, I spent personally many, many days looking for a shot. Um, it, 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 I won't go into the details, but everyone was doing this and they still are. They're rushing around, wasting money and time and effort and being anxious. When if they had allocated the flu shots, the way we allocate bread or uh, I don't know, um, ice cream, then people like me who have, are, I'm not rich, but I'm well to do, I would pay $100 to get a shot. And then we would give vouchers to poor people. And, and if you wish, have special um, programs to go into the favelas or into the poor areas and help people get the shots. I don't mind that. There is an externality involved. And it's quite plain in the case of, uh, of, of, of disease, um, all right. But <laughs> you know, as I'm fond of saying, if we allocated food the way we are now allocating uh, COVID shots, we'd starve. How do I know that? 
because it's happened over and over and over again. I have some jokes about that too. <laughs> Please do tell us the jokes. Well, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll truncate it. This is from Poland. I was there in 1988 and that's when I, before communism fell and I heard this joke. The, the, the wife sends the man to the meat store, the, to the butcher to get meat. And he goes there and there's this long line, meat at the controlled price, at the legal price. And he waits for an hour. He's finally within three of the front and the, and the butcher, the man selling the meat says, we're out of meat, closes the, closes the thing. And the guy gets really angry and he starts shouting. There's still lots of people in the store. He says, we've got to get rid of, rid of this communism. This is terrible. We, we, you know, it's nuts that we can't buy meat. And a man in a trench coat, you know, he's obviously a secret policeman. He comes up, now you have to watch what I do. He says to the man, uh, comrade, you can't talk like that. And he goes like this, now watch. Right, with the, as though it were a gun, right? He, he, he doesn't shoot him, but he does it with his hand. So the guy goes home and his wife says, do you get any meat? Of course I didn't get any meat, this stupid communist country. That, but there's worse news. They're out of bullets. <laughs> that joke because the only way you can run such a system is if you have the bullets no, no, I, I was laughing a second ago no, now i'm worried <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right that's right that's right it shows the power uh, uh, Coercion. Yeah, we, we, which I guess it, it also showcases how good jokes uh, make you worry. They, they, <laughs> they, 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 they ring true. Uh, we are getting close to our last uh, minutes of the allocated hour, Deidre, with you. Uh, uh, I still have a couple of questions. People are, are, are laugh, laughing on the chat and, and they are uh, <laughs> on, on the last joke. Um, I have a, an open question for uh, one of the last ones, or maybe the last one, which I, I think it, it ties. I mean, it's kind of hard uh, pinpointing what's going to happen in the future, but since you are the answer lady and you have all the answers, which you said beforehand, uh, we're going to, to, to take advantage uh, of that. Uh, and, and with this, I, with your answer, I guess we'll see whether you're an optimist on, on what's ahead or not as well. Uh, do, you, do you see a more open world after the pandemic or, or a more closed one? Well, that's, that's the question of the hour. That's the big question. Will people take away from the pandemic the idea that we really need government to be bigger? Or will they take away from the pandemic the stupidity of governments in the United States, Brazil, especially those two, um, and, and say, oh "My God, we don't want any, we don't want very much of this." But um, a long time ago, I wrote a book, which has been translated into Spanish. Can, can which you see we, we, which we cannot see. We are seeing the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Well, I I I, I would have to turn off the Grand Canyon. If, if you are if you are so smart. Yeah. If yeah. you're so smart, the narrative of economic expertise, and it's, it's a powerful point. If I was so smart, if I really knew, I could make a fortune, and so could you. Um, so all we can do as, as liberals is to preach, to speak, to be as, as articulate and clear as we can to try to get people to want to be free adults, um, to not want to have masters. And the trouble is that lots of people want to be children. They want to have a master. And I, I, I want to persuade them that that's not a dignified life for a human being. 
That was great, Deidre. And uh, that was actually the last question, but I have another one. Are we getting you in Argentina as soon as the pandemic is over? Can we Absolutely. Get you Absolutely. I want some of that Argentinian beef, a big slab of it on the, uh, on the, on the barbecue. And I want to see some more tango. I, <laughs> you know the only other country in the world that is obsessed by tango? Uh, Japan and Finland, right? Yes, J Japan and, and especially Finland. And I went to Finland for the first time three years ago. Maybe it was two. And I said, look, I'll come if you get a big Finn to dance the tango with me. Because I want to be dipped, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're dipped uh, before I die. And they did. They got a big Finnish tango instructor to dance with me. And I loved it. So <laughs> it's, it's a done deal, uh, Deidre. We are getting you back to Argentina as soon as... And, uh, and, and uh, honestly, I want to see more of the country. Uh, it was gr great to be there. But I'd like to see the Pampas. Um, and I'd like to, in, in, uh, in Buenos Aires itself, I'd like to see the sort of remnants of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Borges. Yes, Borges, whose poetry and essays I love. We'll be delighted to have you, Deidre, as soon as possible. And we are also thankful for having you, for all of us, uh, for uh, this uh, enchanting hour. I think that people are also uh, as happy as I am on the other side on, on their screens. Uh, they are uh, writing on chat. Some of them we can see with their cameras on. So we want to thank you, Deidre, for joining us uh, today. It has been uh, an awesome experience uh, as always and we always uh, enjoy the way that you reflect on things and help us uh, understand them a little bit better uh, and we hope to see you soon next time and see you here in Argentina of course as well. Okay, ciao, ciao. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, damos por concluido el evento de hoy con Deirdre McCloskey, la profesora Deirdre McCloskey, aquí en Fundación Libertad. Ha sido un placer de nuestra parte. Eh, sigan conectados todos con los eventos de Fundación Libertad. Eh, damos por cerrado la charla de hoy. Thank you very much, Deirdre. We are closing the event. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Bye bye.